Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by PagerDuty, serving as the hub of your operations, aggregating all of your infrastructure, monitoring tools, and alerting the right people and teams at the right time. Sign up today at pagerduty.com slash twist and get a free t-shirt with your first alert. And by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. Hey, everybody. Today on This Week in Startup, Seth Goldstein is with me. He's one of my oldest friends. I met him in 1995 when he was starting companies in New York. And he has a very cool company called Crossfader. As I've told everybody many times, I will never invest in healthcare or music services, but I just invested in Better, the app. And I invested in Crossfader a little bit. Even though I'm very skeptical of the music business, Seth has figured out how to draw me into his electronic dance music, mixing, DJing software that has millions of downloads and, you know, people using it 5, 10, 15,000 times. That's how many times people have become addicted to this app. And we get a surprise phone call in the middle of the show from one of the super fans who um, has quit his job to now dedicate his life to the Crossfader app. It's a very interesting, disturbing, and insightful episode of This Week in Startups. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. Funny how it feeds my people. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. It's me, your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is a show where we talk about being an entrepreneur. Now, one of the things about being an entrepreneur is they say it's a young man's game, right? Young person's game, right? No sexist language here. They say it's a young person's game. Yeah, you get to 30, you're kind of like don't have any good ideas. You get to 40, forget it, you're done. Go be a VC, go be an angel investor, retire. Uh, You know what? There's some logic to that. It's hard. You got to work 90 hours a week, this and that. But you know what? Some of the great entrepreneurs of our time did it in their 30s, late 30s, 40s, 50s, et cetera. Now, why do I bring all this up? Well, because, as some of you know, I'm an old guy. I'm like 44 years old right now. And you know what? There's some entrepreneurs who they just never stop making stuff. And they do some of their best work later in life. I feel like I'm kind of falling into that category. I feel like I'm in a zone right now. Mark Pink has fell into that category. Evan Williams is in that category. There's a lot of people who are just crushing it later in life. I disagree wholeheartedly that the old folk cannot do it. And by old, I mean over 35, which is absolutely ridiculous if you're not in the technology industry. What I'm saying sounds like it's insane, but it's true. There's a little bit of a bias towards it. I bring this all up because on the program today, there's an old friend of mine, Seth Goldstein, who is... Old. All I hear is old. old. I don't old, know how old, old you old, are. Old friend, old, old friends. entrepreneur. We've known each other since 1995. Yeah. <laughs> Good when, to see you. You look good better Good to see than you. Uh, that's not true, but thank you for that. Uh, you look incredible. You thank don't you. look like a day over the day I met you, which is also not true. But we met in the 90s mm-hmm. when the web browser was just launched. And I don't want to make this like an old fogey show, um, but just to set the context, you and I met when the browser was in its 1.0 state. Mm-hmm. Like literally the internet had just received a browser. I worked, and, for, I worked for Kyle and Chan. You worked for a guy named Kyle, Shannon, and Chan Su, mm-hmm. who were the founders of agency.com. Mm-hmm. And people were making CD-ROMs at the time, interactive CD-ROMs. was kind of the height of uh, technology and online services like Prodigy, dial-up services. But there was no web. And then the web happened. Yep. This was late, ni- late 94. 94. Early, early yeah. 95. Um, pipeline. James pipeline. Glick, like James Glick was the dial-up pipeline. service. It was before Mozilla, before Netscape really popped. Right. And I was getting, I think, somewhere between fifty and seventy-five dollars an hour to code HTML for wow. Agency.com in the time Inc. building with Clay Shirky, who mm-hmm. was also an employee or a, yep. a contractor. And I got fired after a couple weeks. What'd you get fired for? I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm 
difficult to manage, to say the least. Yeah, you've always been kind of a <laughs> difficult guy. But you st- the good news is, after getting fired, um, you started your own company. Mm-hmm. Tell us what that company was well, and what the mission of that company. After that, I go. I went to work for Michael Wolf and Company. Oh, my right? God. Burn Raid. Yes. So you went to work for- YPN. From YPN, mm-hmm. which was Michael Wolf's famously failed company, mm-hmm. which, what did it stand for? Your Personal Network. Your Personal Network. And what was it? It was like a directory like Yahoo? It was Yahoo before Yahoo. He had all the – he had the books, right? The net guide books? Yes, the net guide Net guide books. travel, net guide shopping. And it right. was like literally – and people just they, – they, they couldn't imagine it now. It was like a, a directory, a book, physical book. Yes. No ebook with little descriptions of sites and links. Right. And so you had to you'd, type you'd, it in. You'd, you'd, you'd read through, oh, I want to go to that site. And you type it in. And – Yahoo was just starting on the Stanford server, akibona.stanford.edu. And I remember through Michael Wolf meeting um, Joe Krause and Graham at Architect, Architects mm-hmm. before it was Excite. Right. And Yahoo folks and Scott Heiferman, who became a really good friend. Yeah. And Scott Heiferman now is doing meetup.com. Talk about somebody. 11 in our, years. Yeah. 12 years. 40 years old and doing. doing the best work of his career as well. Now, in those early days, there really wasn't much to HTML. There was like, you could learn. Yeah, bra- a, you know, like TD slash bracket. Yeah. It, it was a hyperlink. Coding. There was images. You could do like 10 things. Oh, I can't. I, so I had done CD-ROM multimedia, right. like production. And so learning the web at the time was pretty easy. I could yeah. get paid for it. You know. It was pretty easy. But now, when you did iTraffic, the goal there was... I did site-specific, and Scott did iTraffic. Sorry, site-specific, yeah. correct. You did site-specific in 1996, I mm-hmm. guess. And what was the goal of that company? Because this is pretty... I mean, it's amazing how far ahead of everybody you were. Explain to them, in 1996, what your idea was. Um, <clears throat> I think the idea was just to to do really creative things on the web for brands. Right. And it was pre-banner, even though ironically, this is more inside baseball, but Heiferman and I both worked to help Kevin Ryan when he was at United Media overseeing Dilbert to sell some of the first ads on the Dilbert zone. Right. And we sold like a $10,000 ad for a month to Intel, and it was a big deal. And that was when banners were starting. But at the time, in 96, no one knew what the dominant form of online advertising was. Right. With site-specific, I remember we did a, a, an amazing campaign that I still is my favorite online campaign ever for Duracell. I remember. We got, we got 40% of a contract up front to build their website. We bought, we took the money, we bought chairs and computers and stuff. Um, And our idea was, well, what if behind every page on, you know, behind the pages on the internet, you see a little battery popping out and it's a Duracell and you click it and you see the back of that page with a big battery cavity powered by Duracell. And the idea was like the internet was powered by Duracell and it was really cool and clever. And we could go to all these sites and say, hey, can we give you a reverse image of your site so you can put that behind this link and this is what it was like. There were no standards. Right. And it was kind of breakthrough because you could do whatever you could imagine. And even funny is our 18-year-old art director designer was a kid named Mike Essel who was a freshman at Cooper Union. You know, flash forward, he has subsequently gone on to run the Cooper Union art department as a tenured professor. He left in protest when they had the recent thing of charging kids. And now he's yeah. in San Francisco. I'm still working with him on stuff. That's hysterical. Um, but the nice thing about it is it was a it was a time, as you remember, and you're yeah. part of it, where it wasn't about the suits and it wasn't about the MBA students figuring out if they wanted to go to an internet startup or to a hedge fund. Right. It was a bunch of misfits, creative folks, advertising folks, people with Writers. liberal arts backgrounds, people yeah. who hadn't gone necessarily to the best schools, who were just like... Figuring out, working together, um, you know, partying in a soft way. It wasn't yeah. hardcore partying, but there'd be the cyber suds where you'd meet people. Yeah. And um, and it was great. And yeah. it was, you know, it was you and me and Scott and and Clay and Diane Eisner and, like, this whole interesting... Nicholas Butterworth, Josh exactly. Harris, just a lot Harris of interesting and people and in Borthwick New York. and all those folks. And a lot Craig of them have gone legit. Jeff Dodgers and a bunch of and folks. some of whom we've forgotten about. 
It is interesting how some people as entrepreneurs in that time were very loud and very doing stuff and then you just don't even know where they are now. It's like people were part of like a rock and roll scene that no longer exists. Like punk went away or something and then like you're like, hey, what happened to that band that was really cool? It's like, oh yeah, no, they're in the hedge fund business or something. Yeah. They don't do people anything. People grow up, they have families. They... they give up the dream. Yeah. I mean, I think you see the people that are more opportunistic Kind of, they come into these environments and they want to take advantage. Right. I wish I was like that more sometimes. <laughs> I'd be more, um, uh, more far along in some ways. But for right. me, it was just the I have to create stuff. What well, people don't to. remember about that time was because you knew what the internet was, you were in such a small group of people that you got treated extremely well. Like you could actually be a 20 something, you were 23 or 24, 25 at the time. You could actually go to Duracell and say, give me $50,000 or $100,000. I'm gonna do something for you online. And previous to that, you had to like, to get the meeting with Duracell, you had to work for five or 10 years at an agency and go up the totem pole before they even let you in the meeting with Duracell right. to even go near the client. But this, I think, if you look back on that time, when I think ultimately it was about, it was the decoupling of um, like what you were capable of, your skills, from how long you worked somewhere, how tenured you were, how long you had, you know, paid your dues. And you could just go in and do anything if you knew how to use this technology. Well, I think it's uncertainty and it's risk and it's, um, it's the unknown, right? And so what, what happens in these cycles and whether it's, um, you know, I've seen it price a half dozen times pretty up front, yeah. right? So you saw it in 95, 96 with like web 1.0 yeah. and it was disruptive. It wasn't big. It wasn't billions and billions of dollars and there was no, no Google and there was no Facebook, but like you saw that th there was a fork in the road between the way that in the case of us in New York, media and advertising was being done traditionally and what was happening in this crazy place that, that people were spending all this time in. Yeah. So, and then we've saw it in, you know, mobile, we've seen it, we're gonna see it in the watch stuff, we're gonna see it in. Yeah, uh, social clearly had some. Uh, yeah, I mean, like you know, huge... Facebook, F say, you know, that when the Facebook platform opened up, I started another company in 2007. Like, yeah. I can look at when I've either started or invested in startups, they're typically, the best ones are typically around one of these huge disruptive moments right. where people are like, uh-oh, there's no rules here. The laws, in some cases, aren't clear. Right. Um, it's unclear, you know, who has leverage and the best. It's a free for all. It's yeah. basically like lawless in a way, and that electric means cars. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. So when we get back from commercial break, I want you to talk to the audience about how do you know you're in one of those things, and then how do you sort of break into it when we get back on this week in startups. Ah, yes, pager duty is one of those controversial things that every startup and even bigger companies have to deal with, which is when your developers are at their bar mitzvah, their wedding, somebody else's wedding, vacation, you know, you may only have one person who knows how to deal with a certain piece of software, or a certain piece of code, or a certain server. You don't have the ability to have three or four people who know every piece of your product. Therefore, they must be on pager duty. What is pager duty? It comes from the days when we used to have pagers. It means they have to be available. And if something goes wrong, they have no choice. They have to remove themselves from the Broadway show. They have to leave the wedding, get their laptop out, get on their connection, and try to figure out what's going wrong with the servers. It's hard. It's a pain in the neck. And we wish we didn't have to do it, but the truth is we're building services that matter. There is no choice. Developers and technical people have to suffer through pager duty. But there's a company called Pager Duty that makes it delightful and easy. What do they do? They've made software as a service where you put in all the people who are on duty, who's responsible for what, who's on at different times, and you put in all your reporting. And it routes who should be told that disk space is filled, who should be told that the cache is now invalidated and there's problems and it's uh, got a memory fault, who should know about the security issue. All of those things are organized and done deftly. What happens in a company when that's done well is, all the developers and technical people feel like as a CEO and a founder that you're in their corner and you've made it organized and simple to use. The problem is if you don't have something like that and you try to roll your own, it's chaos. Top clients include Atlassian, who makes HipChat, which I love, Pinterest, which we all love, New Relic, sponsor of the show, who also makes great monitoring software. That's a perfect example. New Relic will put their monitoring into PagerDuty. 
Airbnb, Panasonic, Slack, Path, all these great companies use it. And in fact, Justin Lintz of Chartbeat, which I was the first angel investor, had this to say. PagerDuty gives Chartbeat one central place to send critical alerts. We now have a simple, easy process for on-call scheduling. You can get a 14-day free trial and a free t-shirt with your first alert at pagerduty.com slash twist, pagerduty.com slash twist, pagerduty.com slash twist. And you can follow them on Twitter at pagerduty. Uh, let's get back to Seth. What a great episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm Jason Calacanis, your host. You can follow me on Twitter at Jason, and you can follow Seth Goldstein, my guest, at Seth. He is also part of the First Name Club. He has one less character in his name than I do on Twitter. You have at Seth. I do. God, it's like... Th- we have to make a list of the people who have been on the show who have their first name. I think people are going to start thinking when they watch the show that everybody can just get their first name on Twitter. I'm going to hate to break it to you. If you get to Twitter, you're not going to get at Susan or at Bobby. It's not available. Are people buying those? Can you sell those? Technically, you're not allowed to sell handles. But people do. There is a market for handles. It just What you do is you say, I'm selling this website. And I'm throwing in this Twitter handle. So if you wanted to sell Seth, you would be, you'd make a website called sethsworld.org. Yeah. Seth-world.to, and you say, yeah, I'm selling this, and also I'm going to include the Seth, I'm going to throw in the Seth thing. That's a hack. If they find you doing it, they can confiscate the name. But I think if Twitter was smart, they would create a secondary market for them and just split the money so people could sell them, and then Twitter would take half the economics and just do it on a like leaderboard kind of a thing. All right, so you've created a bunch of different companies, and when you see these big changes going on, how, how do you think is the best way to approach it? Like, for example, we have Bitcoin going on right now. Mm-hmm. How do you know you're in one of those? Like, how do you know if Bitcoin is like actually going to be a seismic shift, or like especially at the taping of this, we went from twelve hundred dollars to, you know, whatever six hundred to eight hundred, and they're like that's the new normal, and then it went down to like three or four hundred, like yeah, that's the price it's supposed to be, and now it's like around three cents. No, it's probably around uh, buck eighty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows what it's at? Um, how do you know if the new seismic shift is occurring? What? How do you? then capitalize on it, I guess, as a founder. I mean, we just had this conversation about Twitter, right? Like, you know, why, why you know, you got at Jason, not because you knew somebody yeah. there, but just because uh, you got to, you scratch a lot of itches, yeah. right? And you're always signing up for stuff. And um, so part of it, I think, is you have to be open-minded, right? right? You have to be hungry for, um sensing changes around you and then you know the me this the 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 um, phenomenology of a meme right so in this case right. bitcoin yeah bitcoin is bigger than the price of bitcoin right a lot of people didn't get that a lot of people still don't get that right i remember it clicked for me in some ways because i remember fred telling me fred wilson we both know from Flatiron and union square wonderful person and investor um telling me like Two years ago, maybe longer, um, an, uh, an LP in a USV. So yeah, you know, I was trying to do a Bitcoin deal, but I couldn't get my partners around to it. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, Fred's pounding the table about Bitcoin. What's happening here? And then you start. I started hearing about the infrastructure plays and the smart yeah. money saying, I don't care about the price of Bitcoin. I'm not betting on Bitcoin the price. I'm betting on Bitcoin as a policy and Bitcoin as a protocol. Bitcoin, right. more and more now, it's about the blockchain. Right. The blockchain, the blockchain. How do we print to the blockchain? So you, you just start to, the stuff starts to Why settle Why are people in your so mind. obsessed with the blockchain, do you think? Um, I am exci- I'm, I'm working on a concept in the blockchain Bitcoin space, and I'm excited about it because... There's a really interesting dynamic with the blockchain that combines um, control mm-hmm. and and transparency. Right. Right. So it's Which not is, about crypto like we're going to hide. Right. It's more like we're hiding in public. Hey, this transaction that we just Did. entered into is yeah. now on the blockchain on the public ledger for anybody to see. Right. And we feel more in control not because we're hiding it, but because we're fully disclosed. It's here. Nobody can feel like that occurred without their knowledge of it or without Mm -hmm. their ability to find it. So we know this wallet gave this wallet this piece of currency at this time. Correct. And then people seem to think that we can use that for other things, like maybe packets of data going around could have the the concept that there's an open ledger. Mm -hmm. And smart contracts and all the really interesting stuff. 
that right. I don't fully so understand. So I but. angel invested in your company, therefore my wallet signed your wallet, and everybody can see the signature here. They don't know exactly what I was signing, but they know a signature occurred or something mm-hmm. like that is in the protocol. And it's not stored in one server somewhere. It's served in a global replicated file that mm-hmm. is the blockchain. So if you read the um, the Times yesterday, did something about um, – alternative credit models and they, they highlighted Max's a firm and some and there's another one about how we used to just have the FICO score right and if you think about the mortgage industry which is you know trillions of dollars of mortgages that burned and you're coming back they were based primarily on FICO credit scores which right. was a very blunt instrument never intended for that I learned this from Lou Rainieri a couple of years, you know, years ago when I was in New York um, and so if you think about what's happening now with using other kinds of data as signals, like what about our, our friend graph? And what about, you know, they were talking in the article about if you fill out a form using all caps versus sentence case, is that a signal for understanding the credit worthiness of the individual? All this data is out there. Right. And then you have the blockchain, which is this idea of like, a, the, the, like the, the great accountant in the sky that everybody has access to. You start to put it together and say, wait a minute. This is a whole new kind of credit system that right. is billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars at stake. That's big. And you know that's big. And it may not be blockchain. It may not be Bitcoin. But it, it's going to be around that in the same way. We knew the internet was going to be big. We didn't know who was going to The web win. or was yeah. it going to be chat? What was it exactly that was going to be the part of the web that – or the part of the internet that would break out? Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. Um, Pattern recognition. It's one of the benefits of getting older. Is that you actually see you actually see the trends, and you're like, this reminds me of this moment in time. People you've, seen were, the, you've seen this play before. Yeah, you've seen right. this movie before. You've seen this play. You know, like, yeah, this is the part where somebody jumps out behind that door. Or, and you still have to be creative because it's not going to play out the same way. Yeah. Like if you remember a couple of weeks ago in the Patriots, um, big Patriots fan. I haven't fully thought through this whole fucking well, they, gate thing. They have gonna, to be I'm, stop absolutely, it, stop it, stop absolutely it, stop disqualified. Stop it. Stop it. Where are you, yeah, and, and you're a Jets fan? No, I'm a Giants fan. Okay. But that's all aside. Cheating is cheating. If you cheat in a game, you cannot reap the rewards okay. of said game. You must admit this as a Pats fan. How did the Giants do this year? They didn't cheat. That's true. They didn't cheat it with how many balls? All, all of them. No, 11 out 11 of 12. Of, oh, 11 of 12. Oh, so they didn't cheat on the ball they didn't use. They didn't go all the way down. I mean, you have you can't, to say— You can't lose a game you don't play, I guess. You can't lose a game you don't play. Yeah. You, know, you never know. The, uh, the Tishes, they famously yeah. said, I learned once at a board meeting, um, you never lose money on a deal you don't do. That's true. Yeah. Never. But in this case— the, the, the reason I was saying this, though, is if you remember— a couple weeks ago, they had the ineligible, eligible stuff. Fascinating, yeah. whether you support it or not. But the point was, they were like, okay, well, how, where does that come from? Because that had never, they'd never done that. And then they looked apparently at an Alabama LSU game, I think, and they saw one play where that happened. Yeah. And like, oh, okay, pattern recognition. Yeah. So somebody, you know, on the sidelines says, hey, I've seen this. Let's try this. Yeah. And that's what good coordinators do. Right. Giants, Patriots, whomever. Right. Um, but I think it's similar here. When you see things happen, and that's what the best venture capitalists are really good at. Right. Is they Don't see the patterns. It. Yeah. Um, and you do that when you look at talent, when you meet people. Right. But I remember when I started as a VC working with uh, with Fred and Jerry. Yeah, you had a stint as a VC. That's right. You did the mobile fund. You yep. did a mobile fund in 1999 yeah, or 2000? 99, too early, yeah. You were five years, six years before the iPhone? The phone, the state-of-the-art phone at the time was a Palm I turned down Tony Fidel. He was trying to fund something uh, out of Philips. I turned down Peter Thiel, who came with some fakakta idea about Palm Pilots splitting the I've turned down you know every billionaire right you know entrepreneur at the time and now you get to see them all here in San Francisco exactly. all the time exactly and, and they don't forget hopefully I get invited to their parties and get to sip their champagne at some point exactly yeah. uh, all right when we get back I want to know about mobile investing in 99 and being too early uh, mm-hmm. on this week in startups 
Hey, everybody, let me take a moment to tell you about a good friend of mine and a great attorney, Scott Ed Walker. Scott Walker of the Walker Corporate Law Group has done a tremendous job for all of the founders I've sent to him over the years. He really cares about startups. That's why he created his own firm, and that's why he charges uh, founders and startups flat rate pricing. So you never get that sticker shock, and he will tell you what you're going to pay for your terms of service, uh, for your employment agreements, for M&A for company formation, all the different services he provides, and he provides all the great services. You can reach him, Scott, at Walker Corporate Law, or you can visit walkercorporatelaw.com, but he literally says, just email me, Scott at Walker Corporate Law. His phone number is 415-979-9998, 979-9998, You know it's 415, because that's San Francisco. Um, and all the people in this boutique law firm have worked at the other firms for 10 or 20 or 30 years. They're just amazing at what they do, and they've chosen their path in life. They've chosen to work with founders, and they've aligned themselves in many ways with this program and yourselves, the people who listen to this program who are startup founders. We're all in it together. He does a great job, and like I said, I've sent people to him. He spent hours with them. He's helped them. He really cares, and that's what you need in an attorney because it's really a partnership. You need them on your side. You need them caring deeply about you uh, and the success of your product. I highly recommend uh, following Scott Ed Walker also on Twitter because he tweets up a storm, and he tweets a lot of good quotes, and he sometimes tweets uh, um, videos that he likes from the show too. So uh, thanks again, Scott. Uh, great guy, and go use Scott as an attorney. He's awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest is Seth Goldstein of CrossFader.fm. We're going to see what that is in just a moment. Um, Seth, of course, is a serial entrepreneur, and he did a stint working with Fred Wilson on a fund that you specifically, I think you raised $30 million bucks for that, $20, 30000000 bucks? It's called the Pervasive Computing Fund. It was right. kind of like a, um, I'd say a focus or an emphasis within Flatiron. It was a right. separate fund. Got it. Um, but the idea was to the, the idea was, and the premise was pretty strong that there's going to be internet devices and appliances everywhere in our lives, right? Right. And that we're going to have some fundamental issues of how do we get information, how do we synchronize between devices, um, and it was very forward thinking. And some good returns came out of it early. Yeah. Uh, Vertical one, Greg Freistadt. Yeah. Sold really early. Um, we did Vindigo. We did. I was going to say Vindigo was a really interesting one. It was Yelp Jason, before Yelp. Yeah. Um, who was that founder, Jason? Jason uh, Devitt, who's Devitt. out here, and uh, David York, who went to a hedge fund. That's amazing. Um, they had Yelp in 1999 on, on Palm, Palm Pilots, Pilot. where you could open it up and see restaurant names. It was basically Zagat on a Palm Pilot. Mm-hmm. But what was the state of the art phone at that time? StarTac with the texting, but didn't have apps? There were no apps. There were you no had apps. Star StarTacs, you had um, the Nokia's. The, the the hip chat the sidekick thing started the sidekick to come started out, which coming was out Andy Rubin who yeah. ended up making Android yeah um, and it was obviously pre iPod iPhone i whatever it's amazing you were five six seven years before the smartphone revolution with a smartphone fund yeah that's I mean it does speak to timing it's time I think what I learned as a VC and I've learned as an investor over the years is um, so much of it is the macro where do you enter? Where do you exit? So if you think about vintage venture funds back of the first bubble, right? You know, if you got in at ninety eight, yep, you're great. If you got in in two thousand, you're, you're underwater. Dead. Yeah. Regardless of what company or what, you picked. it's just it was. It's bigger than you. Right. And I think we've you know we're going through a pretty um, robust time in terms of the public equity markets, and it's like. You know, it, it floats all ships. Yeah, those 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010 funds are doing amazing. The Fred's 2004 fund is unbelievable. Oh, is it? Yeah, well, it's got what? The USB fund. Yeah. It had Twitter. It had... Um, Zynga. It had it Zynga. Tumblr. It had Tumblr. It had, you know. Yeah. That's got to be a huge fund. Probably 200 10X, million. Turned at least 2 billion, yeah. Um, and you see it now with, you know, any funds that have touched Uber. Are yeah. Are sitting on huge gains. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like the more I've learned as a... Investor, the less I feel like I know. I, it's just not my, you know, I'm not that. I'm not, you know, I think to be a good venture capitalist, um, you have to be really patient. And it's really about being a coach, not a player. Yeah. And I know, I guess maybe I'm more like Brett Farr. I just don't know when to hang it up. Uh, <laughs> speaking of not hanging up, let's look at your new product. Yeah. So I'm an, inv- a full disclosure, I'm a tiny investor in this. I basically invested through the Angelus Syndicate. And you know you're the exception to the rule because I always tell everybody I don't ex- I don't invest in healthcare or music, 
but I invested in your product because I'm a fan of yours. So, okay, I feel like I'm at Coachella right now. I'll be there. Okay. I, I went to Coachella for the first time this year. I had a really good time. Okay. Do you feel weird when you're at Coachella as like a 40 something and like there's like 16 year old, 15 year old, 14 year old girls like running around? And No, not at all. You just you unleash your inner 15 year old girl and you put on your. Whatever you, whatever you want, Jason. It's pretty. I, I felt a little bit like I should have been dropping somebody off or picking somebody up for the first time in my life at that event. Okay, here we go. Um, in order to, so I, I, I uh, we roll back a couple years. Okay. Um, moved out to California, you know, worked on some new things out here, and uh, was working with an entrepreneur named Billy Chasen in New York while I was out here. He had been working with John and, and BetaWorks. He peeled off. We started this barcode thing called Sticky Bits, which was great, and I was chairman. And then we had to, we, we weren't getting the consumer traction. This was QR codes. QR codes, barcodes. This 2010, 2011, 2010. And Running people don't dough. know what QR codes are at that time. I remember you explaining QR codes to people. Well, this was actually South using Life. this is using bar. This is actually saying not QR codes. Any barcode. Any barcode. Could, any barcode you could attach a digital something to. An asset. An asset. And then someone else hits that barcode with the same app, and they can read or watch what you would put there. So like every graffiti. storefront has it or whatever. Yeah. Put it anyway, on anything. users weren't there. Yeah. Great story, but users weren't there. Hmm. Um, and Billy had this idea for Turntable. And so we took the money we had. We pivoted into Turntable. got a lot of attention, um, a lot of initial success. Um, Explain to me what Turntable was. Yeah. Turntable was listening to music together in a virtual room. Right. Right. So you'd go into a room online and there'd be 30 other people or a couple hundred people. And you'd all you know, be five people on the decks in this virtual room. It was kind of like... Um, the palace. Yeah, it was like a Second Life meets Pandora. Right. Right? And the hope always that it was going to be more like YouTube and less right. like Second Life. Right. But it became this, for a bunch of reasons, it was really in the end for the fanatics. It didn't cross over to mm. a bigger market of lean, as they say, lean back listening. Right. Right? Spotify did. You know, Pandora has, SoundCloud has, um, Deezer has, you know, there's others. But it was clever. I mean, people were really into it. I remember at my office years ago in 2007, 2008, I had like the developers were all in rooms together listening to EDM and whatever at work, trance, whatever. Sure. And yeah, they would just be in a room with like other people from other companies and just hanging out. It was almost like IRC plus music. Yeah. And one of them would be... People loved it, yeah. right? And I and I exposed. I like you had stayed away from music forever because I felt like you know music and local. There were like there were Vietnams right. of technology that you just knew to stay away from. And yeah, music it's was an unwinnable war. Yeah, not um, to put any make any light of the actual Vietnam War, but yes, there are wars you can't actually win. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of stumbled into it. It blew up. We got like 500,000 users in the first yeah. month for free. We hadn't marketed. We hadn't advertised. And it was exciting to be part of that. Yeah. Which is why music is always a The lure. siren song. It, absolutely. Come here. There's a lot of rocks um, under the water. <laughs> Bring your ship over here. And I had the experience of dealing with uh, the, the record labels and the, the boogeymen who are going to go and sue me and, and, right. you know, and take all my houses and my family and, and yeah. I'll do all the terrible things. Yeah, whacked. Um, Tommy Matola It never comes. happened. Yeah. But... It was interesting to see how inevitably the music industry and and the way it had been run did change the way we built the product. The closer we got to being legitimate, the less life there was in the product. Right, because you're like, oh, go up there and play songs, and it's like, well, am I allowed to do this exactly. or not? Am I? And we what shut off international. The first right. thing we do is we shut off international because we said, okay, well, in order to comply as a radio license, we were only for the U.S. and Canada. And then suddenly you couldn't go into a turntable room. And what was magic is you go into the Japanese, you go into a hip hop room and there'd be kids from Japan and a girl from Brazil. And it would really feel like a melting pot. It was really special. Right. Um, but because of licensing and rights, you can't do I the mean, everybody, you know, you can poke your fingers at who yeah, it was. Yeah. And it, it just, it didn't end well. It's the infrastructure. It was frustrating. Yeah. Um, people lost money. Um, 
Fred was a total mensch and really tried to make it work. And, you know, it's, it's one of many failed music startups, but what was original and interesting was a couple fold. One is it was social, right? This was not about, okay, I'm just going to listen to music right. alone, put on my headphones. This was, it's, a, it, it's, it's interactive, it's social, like the rest of the web had become. Like blogging is social, writing is social. We take that for granted yeah. now. Video is even social. You yeah. YouTube and, sh and, and and sharing it. You stream all the stuff, yeah. And, and music just for a bunch of reasons hadn't gotten there, and that was the hope that it could. And I never gave that up. Right. Um, I saw the like you did the rise of electronic media, right? Of electronic music, music, which yeah. is like. Who is Skrillex and who are these people that people who are pretty like who's people listening Chemical to these Brothers people? and Orbital and Orb right. and like the things we used to see in the '90s in New York was like the start of it, right? And so is that the start of it? I kind of think it's the start of it. Every, yeah, it just goes yeah. back. But you know, definitely. I mean, I remember playing, uh, God, Wipeout on on uh, PlayStation, listening to Chemical Brothers soundtrack in you know site specific in '95. Yeah. Um, but what was different here was that the. Um, the the music was really the DJ culture was it wasn't about people hiding in their studio. This was a, like Dead Mouse is getting five hundred thousand dollars a night in Vegas to to mix music. Right. And you know, and he is a craftsman and he's an artist, but you're also getting DJs who are literally just fading, you know, shifting between songs. Yeah. Getting people to dance. Yeah. And it's become a huge business. So huge. the music business, the recorded music business, has sort of flattened. Yeah. And yet when you think about Coachella and you think about Electric Daisy Carnival and you think about these festivals and you think about um, all the, the energy club scene, and clubs in Vegas and LA, wherever, billions and billions of dollars and Ticketmaster's doing well because people are, you know, they're saving all their money to spend $500 to get a pass for the weekend. Right, for Coachella, whatever. But guess what? They're not going to pay for music. No. Because they think that should just come with it. Yeah, that's like right. I, I get that as part of my experience. And when you go to Coachella or wherever, um, you hear the loops being played in one place and replayed over here. It is very participatory. It's not a bunch of people on a lawn listening to folk music, right? Right. Um, and the Instagramming and the tweeting and the um, the um, Snapchatting, right? So it's very participatory. And the other thing that's very interesting I found is this generation is incredibly eclectic mm -hmm. in that they will go see, like we went to see Lord, and then Beck, and then Lana Del Rey, yep. and then you're going okay. to see Calvin Harris. And, and then it you're, bleeds over. And it all bleeds over. And you're just like, wow, these the same group of people are seeing hip hop, mm -hmm. electronic, emo, folk, whatever, yeah. you know, dance music. And... It's the same night. Yeah. It's not like they're doing it on like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's like it's Friday. We're gonna see seven different genres. Yep. And they're into it. It's not like in the old days where you had to pick one and like that was your tribe. No, and it, it, what what unifies everything is the fact that it is electronic. Right. It's digital. Yeah. Whether it's whether it, it's country sound or hip hop sound yeah. um, or classical, it's it's getting mashed together. Right. And we saw. And as a as a entrepreneur, what what inspired me was I I saw Instagram what it done with photos. Mm. I saw what uh, Tumblr was doing with blogging. I'm like, well, each of these makes it really easy to be a creator. What Instagram did was to say, okay, you know, there's let's say a million. On, these are just rough numbers. There's a million people that use Photoshop. Photoshop is five hundred dollars a, a whatever license. It's for people that are really serious about being digital photographers. There are ad agencies, whatever. I'm Instagram, I'm going to take 2% of the functionality and yeah. make it relevant to 200% more of the people. Yeah. Right? And that's what they did. And they lowered the bar of entry. So now people using Instagram don't even think of themselves as a digital photographer, but right. they are, right? It, it, it just it made it everybody's a creator. The average photo on Instagram with a filter mm -hmm. is probably better looking than the average newspaper photo from 20 years ago, Probably, yeah. taken by a professional photographer. It might have the same composure, but it does look aesthetically, you know, pretty pleasing. So my, my question was, well, why hadn't this happened in music? Yeah, why hasn't it happened in music? Um, good question. Music's hard. Yes. Right? It's hard to really sound good, right? And and yet you have things like GarageBand. It should be easy, but it's still hard, right? GarageBand is very hard. So you, you've got this issue of like the... Um, to understand the, the bootstrapping issue, which is how do you go from a blank canvas yes. to sounding good? 
how do you even understand the interface? Because it's such a powerful tool. People are literally making production albums out of it. Right. How would an individual who doesn't want to make an album but wants to make something fun, you know, take out 98% of the functionality and be able to... So that's, the, that's kind of what we did. Was, yeah. You know, the, the, the light bulb two years ago, our two-year anniversary will be April when we release the version 5. Um, but we launched it South by in 2012. Mm. 2012, 2013. 2013. Um, and the idea was, can we boil down DJing and um, uh, radically simplify it to one gesture, which is crossfading. And I've got two loops, and I'm just going to tilt my phone one way or the other, and it's going to sound good. And we built it on top of that very, okay. very simple. Show me. Show okay. me it's sounding good here. Okay, so here we're picking songs. Is that what we're doing here? Or no, these are people who've done mixing. This is your top list of Okay. Mixing. So what we're listening to right here, this is the new version that we just released, is for the first time, um, okay, this is Ilias, who's actually... There we go. Wow, this is some deep tracks, dude. Okay, so this is a DJ chemist. Um, if you think about it, we've had about you know more than a million downloads. We've had we've been featured by Apple in six in two hundred countries, you know, six hundred times. We have um, people using us all over the world, and. Um, I think 50 years worth of crossfading has happened, and yet up until now we haven't been able to hear how they sound. Mm -hmm. And this is for the first time, when you open up the app, you can actually hear people's mixes. So, so this person mixed Skylarking by BT and yeah. Walking on Clouds by Tiesta. So this is the top chart, yep. and let's just take one. Um, let's go down. I like this DJ. Okay, Chaz, Chaz NFS Gordon. Okay. And experience. Which I loved his stuff when he was in the, ba in, the, in the private beta that we were using, and I used Intercom. And this is what we didn't have years ago, or even with Turntable. We used Intercom and App Annie and uh, Countly, and we used Mixpanel and Kahuna. So we have all the mobile app stuff for tracking and communication notifications. Intercom is one where you can, intercom.io, where we can actually message somebody within our app. Wow. Right? So I, I, I screened it down. I said, okay, within Intercom, of all the people you've seen, um, who has used my product the most? And I made a screen of, like, who's opened it more than 5,000 times? Which is a high bar. I was yeah. like, 75 people have opened it more than 5,000. So I started drilling. I heard this mix. Um... And uh, I actually contacted him. I said, hey, who are you? You sound awesome. He's like, oh, I'm actually a former house DJ. I live in Glasgow. So here he is. I've got this DJ around the world using my tool to make music that I can now 5,000 times. Yeah, and that's a fanatic, right? Yeah. And so what we Love built it. is a instrument that I thought of as like a global remix community. Hmm. So people around the world are using this to mix loops and share them with each other, like a drum circle. And so what I can do, um, this is a guy in Japan. So here's a Japanese DJ. But I'm gonna show you how it works as a user. Um, so he's in Japan. Um, profile page. His profile page. This is him now. I'm walking on the street. You know, three days ago. Uh, come on. Sunday is the best. Um, I just want to get loaded. Yeah. yeah. Okay, there it is. So, in some way, it's like any music for it. I'm just listening to music. What's unique here is I can do all the social stuff, but then if you see here, I can click on it and I can, from where he was, now I am the DJ. Ah, so right? you take so it I just went songs. into him, and, and unlike SoundCloud or Spotify, where I can just listen to it again, right. I'm actually in there reworking it and saying, I like what you did, but I'm going to go this way with it. And right. so I can take this, and now I can go to my packs, and hold on. Can you turn up the sound? Right? So these are my packs, and I, let's say I like that loop, and now I'm gonna go a little bit harder. 
And now you're mixing your own stuff. Diplo, right? Or, you know, where I'm taking this and I'm mixing Diplo with David Bowie, right? Um, and so we've got thousands of these loops in our app. And really, pretty much no matter what you do, if you pay attention, you can sound good. You can rock a party. Right. Right. Um, you're not going to necessarily open up for um, for Skrillex or for 8-track. Right. But when we see that people are spending, they've opened our app 10,000 times, it's like the Malcolm Gladwell thing where it's like, I bet they're pretty good because anything in life, if you do it that often, yeah. you're probably good at it. And they're also probably listening to a lot. This has become the music they want to listen to. Right. Now, you really have one device there. You must, when you have all these people using it, they must be asking you to like add 17 features and get you to go back exactly. to GarageBand. Exactly. How do you know when to add the next feature to let them you know, do so three it's tracks a, it's or a great, whatever? Great, 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 great question. Um, so we just, up until a couple, up until last week, all you could do was share two 30-second loops, mm -hmm. right? And those are pre-approved, sold by you on behalf of Lady Yeah, but you just you could, you put two things together and share it on, on Twitter, and you could, like, it was like a little, it was kind of like a gimmick. You could hear yeah. it cross, like a mashup, a little mashup. Yeah. We spent months now making it so not only you could now share a full, you could, you could share a full performance. You could share 10, 20 minutes, and everything you did, ah. all that data... We transmit and gets rendered on the client, right? Got it. So it's like when we play Xbox against each other. I don't send you all the graphics. I just show you what my controller is doing. Yeah. So we went through all this and we made this. And now we have all these really angry, a handful of really angry users because they were used to the last one, mm. right? And yet if we just added this feature on top of that, yeah. it becomes cluttered. So we... You've got the, you know, you've got the the market research lean startup approach, which is to really test, 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 and listen and do what they want. Right. You've got the Steve Jobs kind of like cavalier, like, hey, you'll know. I'm going to tell you what you need. Yeah, I'm going to curate it for you. And then yeah. you've got to find for your company, for your culture, for your product, on that sort of innovation versus optimization scale. Yeah. With a small number of developers, where are yeah. you? It's tricky. So you just have to make a best guess, <laughs> listen to the customers. You know, Tommy Lasorda says if you're, you listen to them too much, you'll be sitting with them, right? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Who said that? Tommy Lasorda said if you listen to the fans too much, you're going to be sitting with them. Got it. You have to be able to make the so, bold decisions and be able yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, I think what you have to do is you have to, you have to, it has to come from a, from a, a place where you care. Right. Right. So it's not just I'm going to tell my users what to do. It's like, hey, we're living and breathing this. My, you know, our team. Here's our rationale. Yeah. And I think what startups have to do a better job of um, is communicating. Right. To tell, you know, it's like anybody, if you just. Yeah, you it's know, jarring. Yeah. And you want to give them a little bit of an indication about what's going to happen. So now, what does the music industry think of this? Can I load any song into it? Like, if I have songs in my library, can I load my own songs? Would I have to use your clip packs? How does it work in that way? So we initially thought that the gating factor was going to be like a loop cutter so that you could click on any YouTube or SoundCloud song that you like and you turn into a loop um, and, you know, Spotify has, you know, 15 million songs. And, you know, the millions and millions of songs were important. It turns out that even with three or 4,000, and we'll get up to 10, like, it's all, as long as it's the right ones, mm. um, and it's sort of some of these canonical loops, um, it's amazing the diversity of sound. So if you listen to these mixes, people sound really different, right? They can take the same loops and play it this way, where, you right. know, and focusing more on deep house and trance versus old school hip hop, right? And, you know, 80s rhythms, right? right? So people can sound really different, which is important and makes me feel like we're doing something right. Um, choice, I think, is um, people want curation. They want to be guided. So yeah. what we started to do is every day, a half dozen loops, we kind of put in a little pack and say, hey, here's your, you know, today is um, new disco day or right. today is, you know, uh, um, and people pay for those packs, or how does it make money? We don't sell right. music right. on the app. Uh, we promote music. We allow you to find music. So when you're listening to a loop, if you want to buy the full song, it's one click away, and you can go to the Apple Store. Can I pull the full song, though, into the app now, no. or no? So Only 30 seconds. Only 30 seconds. So the way we designed it to be really friendly to the music industry right. is 
you can't get more than a 30 second sample. So, so you're, if you're gonna buy the album, you're gonna use, buy the song, yeah. you'll do that. This isn't gonna replace that. But what's interesting is, you know, in mashup culture, it's like, I don't know what the stats are for people watching TV, but more and more of the time is spent changing channels. Right. So in music, more and more of our time is actually spent listening to what's coming between the songs, not to the song itself. Yeah. And so this is definitely for a generation that wants to personalize their music and mash it up and hear a remix of the remix. Right. Right. Because, you know, we, we heard the Wake Me Up so many times, I want to hear a remix of it by somebody else. And that's, I think, what's happening more and more. And what does the music industry think of it yet? They're just under the radar right now? Or do they look at it and go like, wow, this is incredible. Like, can we get more of our artists in there? Or can our artists make mixes? Or how do they look at it? I mean, I can't generalize, but they've been supportive. Oh, that's cool. I mean, we've been very clear about how we're handling this. Yeah. I think the music, first and foremost, the industry needs revenue, right? They're, they're, ah. they're, they're all very focused on optimizing revenue, whether that's touring or ticketing or merchandise or digital downloads. I mean, once Spotify figured out how to generate money through subscriptions and feed that back to the labels, yeah, they're like, oh, great, we, we want this. Right. Um, Not enough money, though, for some people. Not enough, but I think what happens now in the music industry is, is it's a commodity, right? Right. Once we can all get access to the same catalog of 20 million songs that have been recorded, yeah. right? Then it's just a, it's like, it's like um, AT&T versus Verizon versus T-Mobile. It's just price. Yeah. Right? It's a commodity. Everybody has access to it. I want to get it cheaper. Now, then what becomes important is new kinds of creativity and engagement. Right. So if we have people um, deeply engage with music um, and opening an app 10,000 times, that is not about just listening to songs passively. It's actually right. like they're opening up and they're creating something. They're not creating the content, but they're definitely creating the context for it. Now, what about the sort of level playing field? You have uh, Phil Kaplan's doing that distro kid, you know, mm -hmm. our friend Phil, Pud. Um, and he is trying to allow people to... This is literally a user. Who's... That's one of your users can calling I, can it. Can I get, get him? Yeah, sure. Is, uh, does he know he's live on the air? Hold on. Kyle? Hey, Hold dude. On. Yeah, you got to turn it up. Is he... How are you? Hold on, I can't hear you. Oh, can but you? You're, turn, you're, I just literally. Jacob, I turn it up. I'm gonna turn him to you. His audio is not coming through. Oh, his oh. audio is not coming through. Unplug it. We'll just put it to your microphone. Hold on. Yeah, if you unplug the uh, audio. Hold on. Bow. Are you there, Kyle? Yep, I'm here. Okay, okay I can hear. No, no vaping on camera. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, okay. what? It depends on when he's vaping. Okay. He might be Ask vaping. him. He's a user. But that was not. Did you call because I asked you to call? Uh, no, I okay, good. Involved. Okay, so this is Jason, a friend of mine. He's doing Hi a little. Uh, We're on a radio show right now. You give us up. consent, consent to uh, be on the radio show. He's just interviewing me about Crossfader, so yeah. I was talking about Crossfader, and you called, so maybe you can tell him about it. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, Crossfader is the new way to DJ. Is the absolute best way I have found. I've tried many programs. I mean, I've honestly like to collaborate mixes. I mean, like, it's by far the best app I've ever used. And do you, like, uh, hold parties there in your apartment there, like, uh, or your house? Are you, like, hosting parties and having people come over to dance to your remixes, or are you uh, simply making these to share with your friends online? Well, I'm doing a lot of online right now, but this Friday I have a birthday party that I'm doing for the kids, and then I'm switching it up to the adults later. So, like, that's All right. Kind of so it'll be like baby disco, baby can dance, and then you're going to like put the kids to bed. And then everybody does an outfit change, and you get the vapes out, and you do like mommy, daddy dance party. Is that the story? Pretty much. That's what's going down. And, um, How do you not wake the kids up? He's in be Peoria, Peoria, Illinois. Oh, you're in Illinois. All right. Yeah. It gets a little crazy out there in Peoria, I understand. Well, just a little bit. Like, I mean... It's actually pretty warm right now, but when it gets cold, people get really nice. <laughs> I suppose because it's cold that yeah, you need to stay warm. It's yeah, correct. Exactly. Yeah, no, I heard that about Peoria. Um, uh, okay, so you're a dude in Peoria who uses the app a bunch. Uh, yeah. Actually, now, are you going to pursue a career in as a full-time DJ, do you think? Do you think this is like the stepping stone for you to like maybe get to Vegas and, you know, 
and do a set before, you know, Calvin Harris or something? Are you have aspirations in that direction? Honestly, like, I quit my job because of this app, which is kind of, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot of responsibility for Seth, but it's not like your kids are going to have to quit private school, right? I mean, well, I don't have any kids. Yeah, my okay, kids might, but that's a different. Yeah, that's a different story. So yeah. you don't have kids, so it's no big deal. You quit your job, and you're now going to pursue. He's going to be cross famous. You're going to be cross famous. You're going to try to like. So what's the aspiration? You want to do Vegas? You want to do? A you know, I think we should play one of your mixes. Yeah. Oh, which one? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, listen. Kyle, thank you. Kyle, I wish you the best of luck in your career. Um, and uh, Seth is going to gonna help play. you get I'll a talk gig. To you later. He's going to get you a gig at the... Um, Sounds good. Yeah, he's going to get you a gig at Coachella at the uh, Cross, cross okay, We'll put on Kyle's mix. This is good. You can't, you that can't wasn't invent stage. this stuff. Literally, it wasn't, wasn't I stage. It felt God. a little stage. The guy's like doing a commercial for you. But you literally talked this to your... This is his latest from one hour ago. It's called Miss Catherine Hudson, I Understand You. Who's Catherine Hudson? I think that's the person at the unemployment office that he's working with now that he, you got him to quit his job. No. There's something more to a, that. There's something more to that. He literally quit his job. Oh, I got to get the sound in. Yeah, yeah. Put the sound back in here. Well, let's hear what he's doing here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually be able to tell him right now if this was a good idea or not for him. Um, okay. Turn it up. Turn it up. Let me hear. I'll... It's not fair to kind of put him on the spot like this, but um. it's warming up. He may not have wanted to give up the job. He may have wanted to keep the job part time. Remember, he's got a little bit of work to do. You know, I mean, you know, I think what is in yeah. all like uh, candor, um, we wanted to make something that was easy to learn and hard to master. Right. Right. There's a lot of fluff in the world in the app store. Yeah. There's a lot of quick bucks. Right. There's a lot of companies that get flipped and like that's just not that's not how I go about this. Like I right. wanted to create like a meaningful creative instrument that would be like easy for anybody to pick up in thirty seconds and be good enough to sound good. Yeah. But like for people that are really into yeah, it listen. after ten thousand times that they still want to use it. Yeah, no, we're joking and, about Kyle. But the truth is if you look at the other another company, Smule, Jeff was yep. on the program. I mean that, that we're talking about an enterprise that's making tens of millions of dollars a year, yeah. I believe, and going to go public at some point. And they have a collection of tools, which are like yours, to help people who don't necessarily have the training mm -hmm. actually make music that sounds as good as people who do have the training or some approximation of that. So I think what I, le what I learned from Turntable um, is, is um, giving, you know, when people want, when people, make, if you enable people to make something that they want to share, it's just really powerful, right? Why? Um, so in the case of Turntable, it was like, hey, I'm a, I've got an awesome taste in music. I want you to hear what I'm playing. Right. Or here's my blog post. I want you to know about it. Or here's a picture. Like whatever, whatever the medium is, I think the key is in, in, a, in a case of DJing, it's, it is, you know, Robert DeLong uh, is a great DJ artist, and he has a great song, Global Concepts, where he says, you know, can, does it make you fucking dance? Right. Right? Is that feeling that I get playing it alone fun, but if I'm in a party, and not a crazy party, maybe it's like a parent's party at the private school, or maybe, you know, wherever it is, an office party, but people are doing their thing, and if you take over the sound system, and maybe instead of it being an iPod shuffle, suddenly you're crossfading and people start, they don't realize it and they start dancing. Yeah. You feel like a Mac. You feel awesome. It's pretty That's good feeling. A feeling. You can get people on the dance floor. But if I can give people the feeling of getting people to dance. Right. It's a great drug. It's endorphins. It's dopamine. It's all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean and that's, that's what, what we're going drove for. the DJs originally in the sort of like underground scene right. was to just get people on the dance floor. That so was I got to get in Peoria and be like, okay, I got this guy. He's one of our users. If you have a venue, how, how, you know, can we give you some beer money? Like, what can I do as the entrepreneur behind it? Yeah. To reward him to keep using my app because if he bottoms out. If he ends, he's like, I can't go any further with this. Yeah. Then I've lost that high end and I need to grow the high end and create real artists and breakthrough performers. I mean, 
YouTube gave us Bieber and SoundCloud gave us Flume and others. Like any platform of note needs to break talent. Absolutely. And so we're almost two years into this. We're at the point now, I think, in the next couple months. Somebody will come out of it who actually makes some stuff that's really dope. Yeah, that's and it's never way. by chance. I mean, it's right. a little bit manufactured, but it has to be real. Yeah, it has to be authentic, but you can you can curate it a little bit. And you could actually unlock advanced features too. So like it could be that if you get 5,000 in, you could unlock, you know, or whatever number of crossfades, you've done 100, you could actually- in- We're charging to record. So we've, oh, is that the first the- time is you get a week free, but if you want to sh- if you want to save recordings, it's a buck 99 initially a month. So two bucks a month, mm-hmm. and people are starting to pay it. Mm-hmm. So that could become a sustainable business model. Apple must love it. Apple loves it. But you think about what happens when Beats and Spotify and Google Music all like cancel each other out and have the same thing. They're going to need next-gen subscription products that don't cannibalize their existing business, and I think that's what will come in. See, that's a very interesting concept right there, which is, like, what can I – because people don't want to sit there and be passive. Like, I think that is a big lesson of Turntable, which is even the act of just making an avatar or moving it from one mm-hmm. side to the other, it lets you do something with your fidgety fingers while you're sitting there at your desk. Like, the like button is such a genius innovation because yep. it took the consumers and just said, now you can actually create. You're creating a like. Yep. You're making something exists in the world that did not exist before. Congratulations. I mean, it's meaningless, but congratulations. You, you've impacted the world in some way. And of every object that's put on Facebook, how many, for everything that we put on, like an actual post where we write something or put a photo, the number of likes that we do is probably a magnitude bigger, 20x, yeah. 50x. I mean, that is the core. less of a commitment. The core business of Facebook is people going on there and liking a bunch of nonsense. But it feels like it's a, it's just enough personalized yeah. where you feel connected to it more than if you just read it without liking it. Yeah. Right? It gave you We've been way. trained to like, we like to like, we like to be liked, everything that happens, That's getting the, tagged in pictures, all that is how Facebook. It's like saying I exist in the universe. Mm-hmm. I am here. Like that's, I mean, poke was kind of weird and juvenile, but like is like, it's so manipulatively brilliant because it's like, what, you don't like my child's bar mitzvah or sweet 16 or? Or it's like favoriting in tweets. Like I'm not really going to go back to these ever. No. But I may not want to retweet what you just said, but if I favor, I'm giving you a little kiss. It's like, I like that. I like it. But that's what I always tell people is like, you know what? You're all faves and you know retweets. I don't care. That's it. You know what? If you really want to show love, say it with a retweet. I'm done with the stars, although I do it like crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I can't retweet everybody's stuff. I got 200,000 followers. I can fist bump you, like Chris Saka says, with the star. It's a little quick fist bump, boom. Yes, I read the uh, the tweets there. I get it. Um, so this is actually going to make money. Yeah. You got to get to like a couple of thousand people, and then it's I like- I get to 10,000 bucks a month, and that I'll start to show I can just, it becomes- See, I think that's the thing I was going to tell you, like, because you and I had long talks about this, like- I'm very scared of like investing in anything, music or whatever. I took the leave of faith with you or healthcare was the other one. And I really think for entrepreneurs in your space, in both of those spaces, you really have to show revenue and massive value, not just usage, but like massive value and a revenue stream that people can understand, like Hype Machine and some of these other things I saw online, I was very excited about, but I was like, how does this actually cross over into revenue and sustainability, et cetera. And it was only when I saw better as like a healthcare product, which I invested in or yours, like I'm starting to see like, okay, there's like a tool and a community here. This could actually become sustainable and it's non-threatening and the clips feel like fair use. And do you get takedown notices ever or no? Nobody's, it's too short, the clips. They fall into this like fair use category, I think. But you're, I mean, I think you want fanatics. I mean, the fact that he's like he quit his job, and that's a little, that's a, that's a heavy burden. I know, I saw that look like, on your face. Did you know that before he said it? No, well, I think that's why he's calling me. Um, he's but, like, uh, Seth, listen, I, you and I have been, you know, in this app together for a long time, and I think it's time for me to quit my job and to come to San Francisco and live on your couch. It's like, what was that? The the, the Joaquin, she or her? Her meets the circle. Her, it's like a her. <laughs> it's like a little bit, but I mean, no, but you, if you, when you do the math, when you actually go into your analytics and you see for whatever your app is, you're like, you see these people that are 
almost using it more than your team is. Of course, but yeah, sure like, they are. And I was like, how does someone open? I mean, either at first I thought it was a robot or some. It's got to be an error, yeah. Somebody. No, no, but like, it's not. Like, I, I'm looking at like fifteen thousand times this person has opened my app in six months. What are they doing? I mean, that's. That's you know, be yeah, careful what you wish times for. A day. You have a responsibility, and yeah. yet, given what's going on economically, you see all these apps and these calendar apps just going out of business. So sorry, you know, we're not going to be here tomorrow. And I think you you do have a responsibility to your users if they're going to invest so much. I mean, if it's yeah. mindless going through, you know, yeah. you know, link bait. That's one thing. Or what are they? Listicles. Listicles or whatever. Right? But you're talking about something where people are putting creativity and to work, yeah, and, and people shut stuff down so easily today. They're like, yeah, you know what? It didn't work out, and all your stuff's up here, but you know. Yeah. Good luck to you. It's over. Like TwitPic did that. Yeah. All these pictures are out there. Like, yeah, you know what? Nobody can pay for these services anymore. We couldn't make a deal. It's over. All right, listen, Seth, I wish you uh, all the success in the world. Everybody, Thank stop you. what you're doing right now. Download crossfader.fm. Sign up. Pay the $2. Crossfader somewhere. in the App Store. Crossfader in the App Store. Great name. Crossfader.fm online. Uh, at Crossfader app on Twitter. And Seth is, of course, at Seth. Obviously, super smart guy who. Um, and you got, wow, you really got Google Ventures into this? Mm. Wow. Congratulations. You know, have you had Crane on here? No. He's great. You'd love yeah. yeah, David Crane. Um, you got a really good group of people. And who is the lead investor? Of Me. The, you're the lead investor. Me. I'm the lead. I mean, it's like a testament to like your pull and your uh, I got a lot relentlessness. Of I got a lot you have of so many different investors. to help me get off the ground. Kleiner, yeah. Abbott, and Bing have been great at Kleiner. John Gallaghan at True. And they're like, Seth, we like you. Yeah, let's see what this is. And you can get that seated. But then there's that moment where you have to cross the abyss before, like, you've, you've seated the product. But you haven't generated the revenue you need to break even, uh, and you got to get over that hump. And at least if you can't break even, like you're saying with revenue, yeah. at least show the trend that to say, if I pour in a little bit of this cash, I'm going to have this much revenue coming out. Um, and that's where I am. And check out his book, The Secret to Raising Money. Where can they get that? Is that an ebook or a real Secret book? Secretofraisingmoney.com. The Secret of Raising Money.com, where Mark Suster has been on the program many times, and Danny Reimer, who has not been on the program but should, uh, from Index. Brad Feld's been on the program many times. Fred Koppelman. Fred, you just basically went to everybody. You did a how to guide. You interviewed all these people. And if you could tell me, in like, the at the end of the day, the secret to raising money is write a book about raising money. I'm joking. No. Uh, well, no. If you just stayed in a sentence, what would be like the number one story? Thing? The story. It's the, the story, story. And, and and the passion and and the fact that you know that you, you this VC or an investor sees you and then you know what I don't know if he's going to do it the way he says he is or the way she says she is, but he's he or she is going to figure it out. And I'm going to back him Got or it. her. That That's undeniable. What they want. The inevitability that they it. that they see it. Yes. Yeah. I agree with that. Like you just know the person's going to figure it out. All right. This has been an amazing episode. Thank you, Jason. Thanks to our sponsors. Thanks, Seth. Follow Seth. Thanks, uh, everybody on the team. Uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, soon to be Emmy Award winning producer director <laughs> Jacob, and everybody else on the team is playing us out with a little Tiesto plus uh, yeah, um, Marvin Gaye. All right, listen, we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye bye.